welcome to the discussion on loops. Now, I am not talking about the type of loop you see at an air show, and I'm not talking about Fruit Loops. I'm talking about the type of loops you would find in Visual Basic. I'm talking about the type of. I'm stop it. I'm talking about the type of loops you'll see in Visual Basic. I'm going to use a series of programs to demonstrate different types of loops. The first one is a counting loop where we'll be reading from the keyboard using an input box. I'll ask for five scores. So this is a counting loop because I'm asking for five of something. Next thing I'll do is use a while loop that gets the data from an array. Since the data is in an array, we already know how many pieces of data we have. So this again is going to be a counting loop. The next one is going to be using a sentinel value. A sentinel value is a piece of data that's at the end that tells us we've reached the end. This time I'll use a minus one. I'll also use an array of data with a sentinel value. Next comes up is a game that uses a post test loop. The test is at the bottom of the loop. I play a short little game and then at the end it says, do you want to play again? Yes or no? If the answer is yes, we'll loop back up to the top and start the game again. If the answer is no, we'll fall out and do whatever comes next. Then I'm going to use a for loop, which is a different form of a counting loop. We could do the same thing with a while loop, but a for makes it really nice and very visual that it's a counting loop. And I'll create a table of squares. 1 times 1 is 1, 2 times 2 is 4, 3 times 3 is 9, 4 times 4 is 16, and 5 times 5 is 25. After that, I'll create a nested loop where I have one loop inside of another loop, and I'll create a multiplication table. The last one is going to be a for each. Some languages don't have a for each loop, but Visual Basic does. For each, it says for each item in an array, or I can do a for each item in a group box and just go through and have one loop that goes and looks at every item in a group box. Loops are implemented using one of the three control structures in structured programming. The control structures include sequence, selection, and repetition. It's the repetition control structures that implement a loop. Repetition is also known as iteration. We can repeat a block of code over and over and over again. At some time we have to make sure that we can break out of that loop. The test to break out of a loop can either be done at the top of the loop, this is called pretest, or it can be done at the bottom of the loop. This is called post-test. The first example is a while loop that reads five quiz scores using input boxes and then computes and displays the average score. This is a counting loop because we know before the loop starts how many times we're going through the loop. We're going to be going through the loop five times because there are five scores. The first example inputs five scores using input boxes and then computes the average score. Start, put in 87, 73, 81, 95, and 91. The average score is 85.4. Let's use Excel and see if this is actually comes up to be the right answer. I can use Microsoft Excel, input the same numbers, have it compute the average and see if I came up with the same result. That way I can verify my program is working correctly. Here are the numbers I've input, 87, 73, 81, 95, and 991. Select the cell below it. Right up here where it says Auto Sum, there's a little down arrow with a whole bunch of other functions. I'll select Average. Press Enter. 85.4. I got the same thing. Now I know my program is working and at least computing the same results as Microsoft Excel. In order to compute the average score, I need to add the total of all five scores and then divide by five. Here's what the code looks like. Start off and declare the variables. I'll use a constant and say number of students is integer equals five. I also need a counter to count how many times I'm going through the loop. 
To read the score since it's coming from a text box, I'll use a string because example like 87, well, that's really a character 8 and then a character 7, so those are two text characters. They'll go into a string. I'll convert the string into a double, add it to the total, and once I've gone through the loop five times, then I can compute the average score. Here's what the loop looks like. I'll start off with the total equals zero and the counter equals zero, and say while counter starts off at zero, while zero is less than five, read the score from the input box, convert it into a double and store it into a variable named score, add it to the total, and add one to the counter. So the counter, the first time it goes through, is going to be one. Each time I read another piece of data, the counter gets incremented one, two, three, four, and when it becomes a five, then I fall out of the loop. I can compute the average then, and the average will be the total divided by the number of students, which is five. Display that in the label result. Although this program is fairly small, the code that controls the loop and the code that inputs and computes the average, these two things are all intermingled. So I'd like to separate them. Looking at the loop control, it has a counter, which is initialized before we even start the loop. Then there is the test, there's the while. So while count is less than five, or while the count is less than the number of students, down at the bottom of the loop, we're going to increment the counter, add one. Everything in between, this is called the body of the loop. Right at the top, I have the total being set to zero. Inside the loop, I'm reading the data from the input boxes and adding it to the total. And then when I fall out of the loop, I compute and display the average. The things that are in blue are the loop control. The things that are in green are the things that where I input the data, compute the total, and compute the average. In this program, I'm counting from zero. So it goes zero, one, two, three, four. That's actually five times the loop. Zero, one, two, three, four. We could also count from one. One, two, three, four, five. It's very common in programming to count from zero, though, because later on we'll see arrays. The first element in an array starts off at zero. In the second example, I'm actually using the data in an array. This time, the number of times through the loop is going to be determined by the number of elements in the array. An array is a collection of data in which each element is the same type. In this case, it can either be all integers, all doubles, all decimals. It could even be all characters. Arrays start at index 0. In this example, I have 10 elements in the array, going from 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. That makes 10 elements, starting from 0. The concept of counting from 0 might be easier for people who grew up with a European background. In the United States, a five-story building, the first floor is the ground floor, and we start counting the ground floor from one, two, three, four, five. So a five-story building would be five floors, starting at one, two, three, four, five. But in Europe, the ground floor is really the one that's on the bottom. And then the first floor is the floor above the ground. So in Europe, it would be similar to counting zero, one, two, three, four for a five-story building. Check out this picture of some guy in China who didn't want to sell his five-story building when they're building a road. I'll cover more on arrays in another video, but let's look at declaring an array size. In Visual Basic, it's a little bit different from most other languages. I think they wanted to retain some backwards compatibility with some of the older versions of Basic, where arrays started counting at 1. But, since most languages start counting at zero, they tried to cover both bases. In Visual Basic, if I say dim student scores, open parentheses, 10, close parentheses, as integer, this 10 indicates the highest element index for the array, which goes zero through 10, which is really 11 elements. If I say dim student scores, 10 as integer, then I get an empty array of 11 integers. I can also initialize an array at the same time I declare it. 
So if I say dim list of scores is integer equals open curly brace and then a whole bunch of numbers each separated by a comma and a closed curly brace, then I'll end up creating the array and putting numbers in it at the same time. In this case, I have 10 numbers, and it says 87, 93, 72, etc., all the way up to 98. I have an array that contains 10 numbers, and the index goes from 0 through 9. The number of elements can also be determined by the array length. If I say dim number of students as integer equals list of scores dot length, that tells me how many elements are going to be in that array. The code for the second example is very similar to the code for the first example, except now the number of students, instead of being declared as a constant equals 5, I'm going to say number of students as integer equals list of scores dot length. So I'll determine the number of times through the loop by the length of the array. The third example uses a sentinel value. A sentinel value is a value that says this is the end. Normally, the sentinel value is not considered part of the data that is being processed. I might have scores of 87, 93, 72, minus 1, and the minus 1 says that this is no more data. That says that that was the end, but the minus 1 is not considered, since it's the sentinel value, it's not considered as part of the data. We don't add it into the total, and we don't compute that as part of the average, and we don't count that as the count of the number of pieces of data. The sentinel value method of controlling a loop is very useful when we don't know in advance how many pieces of data are coming in. For example, I might have a lot of scores from students, but maybe one time I have a class where there's 15 students, another class where there's only like 12. Maybe there's 15 in the second class, but only 12 people showed up. Maybe there's another class of 30. What I can do with the sentinel value is just input score after score after score, and then finally put in my indicator that says I'm done. The negative 1 probably is not a good choice if you're inputting temperatures, because it might be like 5 degrees below 0, which would be negative 5 degrees. You have to be careful when you pick that sentinel value. You have to make sure that it's the same data type as the data that's being read, but it is something that could not be considered valid data. When reading a disk, we can also consider the end of file marker to be the sentinel value. Read the disk, read, read, read. When you reach the end of file, you're done. So that's our sentinel value. In a sentinel value controlled loop, we have to read the first piece of data before we even start the loop. That way, at the top of the loop, when we test to see are we at the end, maybe there's no data. So if negative 1 was our sentinel value, it says start inputting scores and a negative 1 when you're done. Well, I want to be able to put in a negative 1 to say I'm done. That way I have no data. I have no pieces of data, just the sentinel value. We read the first piece of data and then we test to see if we've reached the sentinel value. Then there's the body of the loop. If I'm doing an average of scores, then that's where I add it to the total and have to increment my count. And then I read the next piece of data. That's all the way at the bottom of the loop. It kind of looks weird, but that's the way it works. The bottom of the loop has read the next piece of data, and then we're going to loop back up to the test to see if we've reached our sentinel value. Here's a comparison between the counting loop and the sentinel value controlled loop. At the top, in the green, I'm setting up my variables, so I have total equals zero. Now, in the counting loop, the count is really part of the control for the loop, so I put that in blue. So I have count as a blue, and then count is less than or equal to 5 in the counting loop. I'm determining whether or not to loop. If I don't loop, then I read a score, add to the total, and then increment my count. In the sentinel value controlled loop, reading the first piece of data, it's the data that's controlling the loop, not the count. So I read the first piece of data, and I said, did I reach the sentinel value? If not, then I add it to the total, and then increment the count, and then read the next piece of data. So it's the 
it's reading the next piece of data that goes at the bottom of the loop. And that's where I'm preparing to see if I need to loop again. Here is the sentinel value of first example, or example number three in the video. I'll use the same numbers as before. 87, 73, 81, 95, and a 91. With a minus one, I ended up with an average score of 85.4. Cool. Let's clear it and start again. I'll put in 15, and 17. Minus 1. Now I only have two scores. Average is 16. Good job. Try again. Just put in minus 1. Aha! Average is 0. Let's see how that one works. Starting off, I set count and total to a 0. These are initialized, but they're not part of the sentinel loop. First thing to do is to read the score and convert it into double. It takes two lines to read the score and convert to double. I do that before starting the loop. Then so while score is greater than or equal to zero, I'm going to stop the loop when a negative number has been input. Add it to the total, increment the count, and then, right at the bottom of the loop, read the score again. Now all the scores have been total, I can compute the average. I'd better make sure that I don't try to divide by zero. So if the count is non-zero, I'll set the average to total divided by count. Otherwise, I'll set the average to zero, just to have something to display. In the next example, I'm going to be using a sentinel value again, but I'm going to read all the data into a text box, a whole lot of different values, and then use a sentinel value to identify where the end is. Set this up as a multi-line text box so I can get lots and lots of data. I'll use the string.split function to break up the string into multiple pieces. That way I can have my input string, which is one big long string with a number, space, number, space, number, space, number, space, and then I'll take each one of those numbers and put it into an element in the array. The first thing the program does is use the split and I can use a tab or a space. So here's the split function. It's going to take all the data from my text box and put it into individual numbers inside of my array. Let's see how that one works. Start off, first thing to do is I have an array called score list as string. So that's an array of strings. I'll say I want to split my text scores dot text into individual pieces separated by spaces. Now it's very similar to the previous one where as long as I have a negative one I'm using for the sentinel value everything works. Actually we could look at that array and find out how many pieces of data are in it and use that as a count and use a counting loop instead of a sentinel value but I'm using sentinel value here anyway. The next example is using a post test loop. The post test has the test at the end. Because the test is at the end, the body of the loop is guaranteed to execute at least one time. Something inside should finally cause the loop to terminate. Here's an example of a multiplication game. In the body of the loop, I'm going to say the game goes here. Then, where the test is, it's a combination of asking the user, do you want to play again? and then seeing what the result is. If the user says yes, then I'll loop back up and play the game again. If the user says no, then I'll fall through the bottom of the loop. So, dim answers message box result. Message box result is actually an enumerated data type. It makes it a little easier to process the results coming out of a message box. So right at the bottom, I'm going to say answer equals message box dot show would you like to play again? And then I have message box buttons dot yes, no. And that's going to define what type of buttons show up on the message box. I want yes, no. And then loop while the answer equals message box result dot yes. I could do the same thing and say loop while answer is not equal to no. Right at the top, I'm declaring the variables. And then the last thing in my variable, dim answer as message box result. That's going to set me up so I can accept that yes, no result. Do. 
Here is play the game. So all the stuff in here for playing the game, x equals rand.next11, that's going to give me a number from 0 to 10. Then y equals rand.next11, that gives me a number from 0 to 10. If I would have said x equals rand.next10, then I would have gotten a number from 0 through 9. Put up a message input box that says, what is x times y? I want to make sure I get back a numeric response, otherwise I'll set my response to 0. You tell the user either great job or you messed up. Okay, if the response is equal to the product, the product is x times y, so that's what I'm expecting. So if the response is equal to what I was expecting, I say great job, and I increment the correct score. Otherwise, say the correct answer was, and tell them what it was, and increment the number of scores wrong. Display the score. Then down at the bottom, use a loop to play the game again. Answer equals message box dot show. Would you like to play again? with a yes no uh, buttons and then a loop while the answer is yes. So let's see how that thing works. Start the game. What is two times four? Eight. Great job. Like play again? Yes. What is two times one? Two. Great job. Would you like to play again? Yes. What is eight times five? Thirteen. I did a plus instead of a times. Uh, oh, correct answer was 40. Would you like to play again? Yes. What is 1 times 5? It's a 5. Would like to play again? Yes. What is 10 times 1? One? 1. Uh oh, correct answer was 10. I'm not doing too good. Just don't tell my fourth grade teacher about this one, okay? What's 0 times 9? 0. You'd like to play again? No. Okay, I am done with this one. So it's not asking me to any more questions. Are you ready for some negative thinking or backwards thinking? Visual Basic not only has a do while or a while loop, but also has do until. The test is just the complete opposite for the until and the while. For example, if I say do x plus equals 1 while x is less than or equal to a 5, I could also write the code and have the exact same result as do x plus equal 1 until not x less than or equal to a 5. So the while and the until not are the same thing. I could also write it as do x plus equal 1 until x is greater than 5. How about the game? Dim. Answer a string. Do. Play game. Well, answer equals yes. Or I can say do. Play game. Until answer is not equal yes. It's kind of reverse logic there. Do the same thing. Do. Play game. Until answer equals no. The next example is the for loop. The for loop is a counting loop and it's a lot easier to visualize than a while loop, but a while loop could always be used in place of a for loop. The for loop starts off, it says for, and then some value equals, and we're going to do the initialization here. This example says for i equals 1 to 10. We're going to go through the body of the loop 10 times. At the end, we can tell the end of the loop because there's the statement next. You could say next i, but the i is optional. The for loop also has an optional step value. Step determines how much to add to your counter each time you go through the loop. In this example, it says for i equals 1 to 10, step equals 2. So we're going to add 2 to i each time we go through. The value for i inside the loop is going to be 1, 3, 5, 7, 9, because 2 gets added each time. This is an example of using the for loop to create a table of squares. Dim i is integer, i equals 1 to 10. Then we put in the label used as output. So it says label output dot text, ampersand equals, that says add on to the end of what's already in that label. 
I concatenate space squared is space concatenate I times I and then concatenate BBCRLF that says carriage return line feed that's going to move the cursor down to the next line I get a table that says 1 squared equals 1 all the way to 10 squared is 100 when I was a kid we had peachy folders that open up and close and you put all your school notes in there and everything they also had a multiplication table there they had things like how many feet are in a mile and how to convert from Fahrenheit to Celsius for degrees I'd like to put together a program now to recreate that multiplication table and I'll use a nested for loop so I'm going to have one for loop that goes across the line to put out part of a multiplication table now that one is going to be inside of another loop which moved me down to the next line so I'll go down the line and write all the stuff for that one line then go down to the next line write all the things for that line go down to the next line write all the things for that line got the idea so I have two for loops one move me from one line to the next and the other one goes all the way across here is the code it's a dim row comma column so some people don't like to do that is to create more than one variable on the same line but well I did it okay take away my keyboard dim row comma column is integer so I have a row and a column then LBL output dot text equals string empty so now my my um, my label is empty for row equals 1 to 12 inside here is where I'm going to do all the stuff to move all the way across then at the bottom LBL output dot text ampersand equals BBCRLF that way I can move down to the next line here's the stuff for going across it says this is my inside loop for column equals 1 to 12 LBL output dot text ampersand equals string dot format now this is going to be a little bit fancier because see, the problem is is I need four spaces in here because I might have like a, a hundred and twenty one so one two one and then I want a space between the hundred and twenty one and the next column I have to do a couple of things here one is I have to make sure I use fixed space font I could use Lucidia Sans typewriter or Courier New I want a big space because like a one is a lot smaller than an eight if I don't use a big space font everything's going to be kind of weird and the columns won't line up the other thing I want to do is make sure that I have the same number of characters in each column and that's why I'm going to be using the string dot format routine string dot format is pretty cool Here's an example. It says LBL output dot text. Now here's the string dot format. The first thing that goes in the string dot format is my format control string. It's in quotes. It says quote. I have an open curly brace, and then I'm identifying my argument number. The arguments are going to be the things that occur inside my parentheses, but they occur after my control string. I only have one argument in this case, so is argument zero comma four I have four spaces so that column is going to be four characters wide close off my control string with the quotes and then a comma then here's my value it's row times column so that right there even though it says row times column there's still one value there pretty cool here's some more examples with different argument numbers dim f name is string equals fred dim l name is string equals flintstone so lbl output dot text equals string dot format inside my control string i have quote my name is so everything there is going to be printed out exactly as it shows then here's my open curly brace zero close curly brace space open curly brace one close curly brace and then the end of my control string so F name is the argument zero that shows up where it says curly brace zero curly brace. L name is going to show up where it says open curly brace one close curly brace. So that's my argument zero and my argument one. It says my name is Fred Flintstone. If 
you believe it. The next example, LBL output.txt. The only difference here, as I said, open curly brace 1, close curly brace space, open curly brace 0. So I'm going to print out L name before F name. So then argument 1 shows up before argument 0. This time it says my name is Flintstone Fred. How about dim x is integer equals 7? Then I have argument 0, which is x squared is, then I have argument 1, which is x times x. So we'll say the value of 7 squared is 49. We've already covered the counting loop and showed even how we can step through an array by using the index. We also have a for each loop. This thing is really cool. It doesn't even exist in some languages. What the for each can do is, if you're working with an array, it can pull out individual elements from the array one at a time. And you don't even have to step through. You don't even have to identify the index position. We can also use for each to examine different controls that are in a group box or some other type of collection. I'd like to show you how we can go back and revisit the fast food program and make it a little bit easier to work with, especially if we want to change any prices. Are you ready? Here it is. Here's an example of how to use the for each loop with an array. What I'm going to do is to compute the sum of the numbers in the array. And the numbers are like 3, 6, 8, 5, 1, 9, 4, 2, and the total is 38. Starting off, I have dim values and integer. This is going to be the value that I pull out of the array as I step through each part of the loop. And here's my array of integers. Dim total is integer. Here's the good part of the for each loop. It says for each value in numbers. So I don't even have to have an increment. I don't have to have an index value. I just say total plus equal value. That way, each time we go through the loop, we're going to grab another position in the array and add it to total. In summary, we had the pre-test while loop that does the testing at the top of the loop. There's also the post-test, which does the test all the way at the bottom of the loop. We have the for loop, two different types, a counting for loop, for i equals 1, 2, 10, etc. There's also the for each. I hope you enjoyed the loops. Very, very powerful, and they occur quite often in programming. So have fun and enjoy this wonderful world of programming. Bye-bye.